got our regular Monday guest, expert on foreign policy, Stephen Yates, foreign policy expert with the D.C. International Advisory, also former advisor to uh, Vice President Dick Cheney. Stephen, good afternoon to you. Hi, Dana. Thanks for having me back. Of course, always. I want to get your thoughts on the furor that erupted last week concerning Michelle Bachman, Louis Gohmert, and a number of congressional members who wrote a letter asking, uh, simply asking for congressional inquiry into uh, some of this information that they have or that they're concerned about uh, regards to the Muslim Brotherhood in Washington, D.C., uh, what, first of all, I'm going to ask, what did, what did you think of the letter? Because it didn't seem to me to be any sort of definitive statement on guilt, more so an expression of concern. Right. Well, the letter, uh, I think the letter speaks for itself. I think people can get a copy of it online. I think the Center for Security Policy and other places probably have uh, details on the concerns outlaid in the letter uh, and some of the responses that they have, uh, because they've been tracking these issues extremely closely. Uh, but the letter itself essentially is an expression of concern. Uh, it, it, it encourages the inspector general uh, to uh, investigate whether a top aide to Secretary Clinton uh, does or does not have compromising ties to the Muslim Brotherhood. Now, anyone who's on the receiving end of an accusation or an insinuation, you can be very, very sensitive uh, to such things. Uh, what's extraordinary to me in this case is how far uh, the defenders of, of this individual have gone, uh, the breathless Republican attempts to say how it's sort of beyond the pale to even ask questions. Right. Uh, now, merits of the case are, are to be sorted out. Uh, the methodology involved, I'm not entirely sure uh, whether they addressed this to the right office, to the right part of the government to go after it, but that's a staffing issue. Uh, but the political furor is just nothing short of just an attempt at political assassination of Michelle Bachman and the people who raised the issue. Uh, and so, I mean, they, they're going after her character, going after her intellect, and, and sort of saying it's improper to even ask this question. Right, uh, which is given, concerning. Given the way things are unfolding in the Middle East, how is it incorrect to ask questions about the loyalty and propriety of people with family ties in that part of the world uh, more so than, say, if you had a top former North Korean advising on a compromise policy towards that regime. Absolutely. And, and you and I have talked about this for months, especially. We've discussed the Muslim Brotherhood's influence and presence, uh, not just sometimes as a political entity, which, you know, and I even think, and, and, and I want to ask you about this too, uh, not just a political entity, but even a player in the game. And one of the things that I think, you know, you mentioned uh, Senator John McCain, and I wholeheartedly agree with you on this. I, I believe that they're looking at the Muslim Brotherhood incorrectly. They they look at it, the people who are defending, uh, you know, those named in the letter, they're looking at the Muslim Brotherhood as though it's some sort of political organization. But it's not. This is this is a religious entity. Do you think that they're wrong in their approach on this because of that? I think they're very wrong on their approach. Uh, but a lot of the defenders uh, of this staff advisor – uh, and the, the sort of full-throated attacks have come from people who have, in fact, in recent months, gone to the region and mm -hmm. met with the Muslim Brotherhood. Oh, yeah. uh, and so, uh, you know, they themselves uh, are perhaps preemptively going a bit above, the bo above and beyond self-defense. Uh, but when it comes down to it, I mean, the Muslim Brotherhood is an old organization in the Middle East. It is the organization from which the modern form of political Islam comes from. Uh, it is the intellectual and political organizational base that has modern offshoots that are violent Islamism uh, and other problems we have in the region. Now, as with any old and growing and region-wide organization, you're going to have different offshoots and different individuals. But that's for an intelligence community to go after. That's for an FBI to discern. Right. It's not really for politicians to go out and, and say things definitively. And frankly, I don't think that Congresswoman Bachman and the others did go beyond the, beyond the line on that. I can see why people who are subject to these questions are very, very sensitive, but it doesn't make the question inappropriate. Right. Absolutely. I, I, with this, too, just in the defense of even from those on our side, it does – 
I, I think that there is kind of cause for concern. And, and again, we've talked about how uh, the White House officials were entertaining Muslim envoys from the Muslim Brotherhood. I don't ever recall a time. Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong on this. You would be the man to know. I don't ever recall a time when the when the Muslim Brotherhood ever before was welcomed into the United States and and and, and th- given a red carpet reception in Washington D.C. basically and and meeting with White House authorities. I don't ever remember a time when you know our government considered the Muslim Brotherhood to be a stable enough or worthy enough entity to endorse their candidate in uh, in a presidential election and the the power struggle after which. I mean, didn't we used to think of them as a terrorist organization? What on earth has changed? Right. Well, obviously, since President Obama has declared the tide of war to be receding, there's no such thing as terrorism anymore, apparently. Uh, And so uh, I honestly do not understand any legitimate methodology in terms of the approach to embracing of these movements and these people. I can understand that we have to accept the outcome of electoral processes. Um, it was not our business to take over a country and sort of help them on their on on their behalf select their leaders, but we do have a lot of choices about how much we, moral authority we give them, uh, the way in which we engage them, uh, and uh, we have gone very fast uh, to embrace the Muslim Brotherhood outcome in Egypt. We have still a lot of uncertainty in the broader region. We could end up with a Muslim Brotherhood or other radical-led uh, government in Syria if, right. if the uh, civil war there uh, comes to a near-term conclusion. Right. Uh, so we have, we, you know, they, they are answering questions before the dust has settled in the region in a way that's highly questionable from an American interest point of view. And there's just no doubt where these organizations have come from. You can say, well, they've mellowed in their old and middle age as political movements, Fine. Mm. Let's prove that, and then we can be less worried about these associations. Right. What do you What do you make? Too. I want to change it up just a little bit uh, because of of Syria and several reports that I've seen about Syria now uh, threatening to use chemical weapons on uh, the resistance, and all of a sudden now that weapons of mass destruction, which we heard so often in the '90s, is is a refrain that we are hearing again when it comes to Syria. Is this? Uh, you know, there are a lot of individuals who are who who are I think are trying to make the comparison to Iraq, uh, with as the story about chemical weapons and so on and so forth develops with Syria. Is that what do you what do you make of that analogy? Is that off base? Well, there are definite parallels, uh, but you can also draw up a very long list of what's different. Hmm. Uh, I mean, one of the things that's very very different is you don't have fifteen, sixteen, and on close to 17 U.N. security resolutions condemning the programs, uh, imposing sanctions, efforts by inspectors, and all of that. I mean, people who want to dial back uh, can find the history of all of the efforts that the so-called international community tried to deal with things in Iraq. We really, at the moment, don't have an international strategy for dealing with Syria. We don't have a functional U.N. Security Council, if there ever was such a thing, and we don't have an American-led strategy either. Right. I mean, really, our president has said Assad must go, uh, and our State Department is breathless in saying we're not arming the rebels, and yet they sit back and say there's a human tragedy going on and a civil war with regional repercussions, but they don't seem to really be doing anything else. They have this a lot of media today trying to tout quiet diplomacy. Quiet diplomacy is the equivalent of a hotel room with a sign outside the door saying, do not disturb compromise and progress. Uh, so there's just we don't really have a plan. Uh, I think that uh, it's a dangerous situation anytime chemical weapons, biological weapons, or any form of WMD are involved in the world's worst hands. We can't feel fully safe, but I don't think that there is any rush to war akin to what was going on in Iraq. Right. Uh, and uh, you know, I think that unfortunately we're going to be reacting rather than shaping events. And uh, we'll we'll take our chances on the President Obama's approach for now. Uh, definitely. One one last quick uh, news bit. There's been so much that's that's happened, Stephen. Uh, obviously, as you know, in the past in the past several days, uh, Mexican President Felipe Calderon. You know, you and I talked when he came to the United States and he stood there uh, with uh, Stephen Harper and President Obama in the Rose Garden, and they took so many questions except for the Keystone Pipeline and Fast and Furious. And we've talked about how uh, President Calderon's never said anything about Fast and Furious. 
But he waits until after the Aurora shooting, and then he says that uh, he condemned U.S. gun laws, according to Reuters, and said that uh, our country needs to uh, revise and, 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 and review our gun laws. But, of course, he wasn't making this at all in response to Fast and Furious. That had to be purposeful, to leave out Fast and Furious. It just, this seems off to me that he's never said anything about that. Well, it is off, uh, substantively, and and it sort of has all of the smell of some kind of a quid pro quo. I mean, what interest is it of his to emphasize gun laws as he presides over a country with rampant violation of whatever law they might have? Mm -hmm. Uh, And so, I mean, really, he's in no position to tell anyone else about making or enforcing gun laws. Uh, Now, I also don't see how gun laws were an issue in Aurora. We still have a lot of facts to sort through on that, and I'm sure that you're having a lot of discussion about it today. Oh, right. Uh, but, you know, really what you have is law and societal norm violators. How are we going to find these people, profile these people in a way that still has some semblance of respect for civil liberties? Uh, but, you know, this really doesn't have so much to do with laws. Someone that's willing to just walk into a theater and kill a bunch of random civilians, you would have used any other means available to him. Right. Uh, and so it's it's really, I think, just missing the mark. And for a foreign politician, especially one with an outright gang war going on in his country, I mean, really, he's not in a position to throw stones. But it doesn't show any seriousness that we hoped might have been the case with a change of government there. Right. Absolutely. Well, Stephen Yates, we so appreciate your perspective. And I know it's been it's been a very busy several days for you. Stephen Yates, foreign policy expert at the D.C. International Advisory, dciadvisory.org. We always appreciate it, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. All the best. All right, take care.